of a digital trail for connecting the Hunterian collections and engaging visitors in an exhibition. After that, I don't need to say that with organizing the conference, I didn't spend the most doing the talk, so I <laughs> you need to be forgiving and understanding. Um, but it's very nice to have this um, after the other two talks because I think uh, we're touching the whole range and we're still staying with the theme more or less of art museums, although the Hunterian is not just that, but there is, we have, we are now called the Hunterian, with a capital T, and that's the merge of the Hunterian Museum and the Hunterian Art Gallery. And because the exhibition I'm going to talk to you about was at the gallery, we're sticking more or less with the art historical theme, but more importantly and more relevant to the last few days' discussions, we are exploring with this one as well some of the issues that both the previous speakers but also uh, some of the others both days have talked about, all about engagement, but also dealing with usually in most cases in cultural heritage quite a complex set of original data and collections, whether in digital or in analog form. And because I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the conference my split personality and my dual role, um, you, on, I'm half at Hattie at the School of Humanities and it's a joint post and apart from the joke, Mary Peter Messon yesterday at um, Mark O'Neill's introduction, he's very fond of this dual jobs. I knew when I accepted the post that two halves in academia and in cultural heritage don't make just one whole. But apart from the workload, it's actually very exciting and you can see the logic between the Hunterian and this kind of diverse university and uh, multidisciplinary collections working uh, with the department at the University of Glasgow that does a lot of digital humanities, digital heritage research, apart from being the highest recruiter of our two PGT courses on both information management preservation, mentioned uh, management of archives here at the morning session, as well as museum studies. So, because we don't have much time, uh, I just wanted to very briefly talk about the whole context of the project. The Hunterian is undergoing a period of change together with the rest of the university. This today, for example, and it's so nice for me to see this was my idea of what the Kelvin Hall should be about and bringing people like all of you together to talk about questions like that. But I don't know if you realize we only moved here into the offices upstairs in August. We are very new. This is very new. And it's also making us rethink the way we teach, we do research, we liaise with people within the university, which surprisingly enough, sometimes I discover I have to go to the other end of the world to, to find out what they're doing about, as I'm sure you find the same with your own institutions, but also very importantly with our communities and users beyond the university. So for example, this was at the background, the night at the museum, something we started last year, and it was a brilliant event, very nice atmosphere, but it takes so much effort, as you all know, to do this seamless and smooth sort of transition to this very fun night and bring the educational element together with the more entertaining and relaxed uh, kind of meeting of different people. So, um, you, I don't know if you had the chance because we packed so much in this program and it's a shame for those of you not from Glasgow for the first time in Glasgow to try, it's only 10-15 minutes walk to go across to the campus and see the museum. People don't realize the Kelvin Hall is a study research center facility, we don't have an exhibition stage in phase one. The rest of the building which is closed, there are big plans about exhibition spaces but which require big money as well. So we don't know exactly when or how they will be materialized. So in the meantime, it's business as usual, both the museum and the art gallery, which is just, it's the two sides of University Avenue, I'll show you a map in a minute, are uh, nearby. And we have a very diverse, I've just put a very, very small sample of the kind of collections we have. Because William Hunter was, in the 18th century, our founder uh, to whom we owe the name, was not just an obstetrician and a doctor and a teacher of students, uh, but also a great lover, a passionate one of collections. And because he wasn't just any doctor, he was the obstetrician to the queen, he could afford to collect from around the world. So we see the results of some of this still today. It's all very exciting and it's very diverse, but it's also the collections, and not just the ones on show, but mainly the ones um, at the stores. They are still, even today, after Kelvin Hall has opened, they're all over in different locations, not just in the campus or beyond. And even the exhibition spaces, the Zoology Museum is currently closed. The map is not a very large one, but maybe you can see the Zoology is the green one. The main museum is the pale blue. The pink is the Hunterian Art Gallery on the other side of University Avenue. I just put with the, at the very bottom of the map Kelvin Hall. It's just at the edge of the map. We're just on this side of the river. Um, but it's also, there's also the Anatomy Museum, uh, which is a kind of 
blue green on the on the right hand side and um, I don't know if Caroline uh, is here she was the designer it's great uh, to see uh, Caroline Alexander not only graduated from museum studies course but uh, I'll show you how some of her designs we incorporated in this application because we were fortunate enough that she had a background from the Glasgow School of Art and was very artistic as well as very good with the museum studies kind of thing so um, this embarrassing as it is, um, some of these are where our storage facilities, so you can see where we're desperate to get to Kelvin Hall and store the collections in much more appropriate conditions. But what a lot of managers and people not dealing with the cultural collections not rea don't realize, this is a huge undertaking. It's more than 1.5 million. I don't think to preach to the converted to tell these things to people dealing with collections here, but we find that we have to say and say it again. It doesn't happen overnight. It's going to be take at least the rest of the year to even make a move of some of these things. So when you do your walk in the corridor, the avenue, excuse me, Parker Jones, on the right-hand side, you see part of Glasgow Museums. You cannot see visibly unless you go upstairs to some and make an appointment for, for our stores. But even there, it's only a small part currently there because this is a very, it requires a lot of effort and a lot of extra uh, staff in our decan team. This was part of our uh, old um, Thurston Street stores and some of our lovely students who take the time to be photographed with our lovely objects. <laughs> and, uh, Rosie, unfortunately, before organizing the wasn't even asked. We had a photograph of her and she's plastered all over the posters of the University of Glasgow because she looks so nice holding one of our objects because she was also one of our Hunterian associates. I don't have time to talk about all our projects, but just to mention very briefly, HAPS, the Hunterian associate program, and when she was still doing her PhD before she, she completed hers, uh, people like her, not just from the College of Arts, but all the colleges, we try to open up more to the sciences than the other colleges, but predictably we have very strong links with the College of Arts within Glasgow University. People who are doing their PhD, if they can convince us and write a good proposal that they have to do something in some form with our collections, even a very broad and quite creative association, we'll really examine it. And then because it's getting quite competitive, the program, um, then they, they become fellows and associates and throughout the year they have a lot of opportunities, a really good win-win situation for public engagement, using our facilities, we have open eyes and other occasions. They also use a lot of digital to both showcase our collections but for them to get really valuable skills because you all know PhDs are not no longer the times you lock yourself in the library for three years and you think and read. So you have to engage a lot throughout. So what we developed here is underpinning a lot of the key strategic aims, but also I'm responsible at Hunterian for designing the digital strategy. And I know Karen very rightly said, don't give me a digital strategy, just tell me what you're going to do with your content and maybe that link it with that. It's a work in progress. It was a document that was very keen. It won't be on the shelf, but something to help us kind of question what we're doing and think with colleagues where we want to take things because digital, of course, underpins everything we do, the way it has in your institutions. Um, but we are also, we do have valuable resources, our staff, not always appreciated, and our students, I think, as a university museum. But we are a relatively small team of professionals paid to kind of deliver all of these things. So it's very important to do a lot of co-curation, co-creation, and think appropriately for our mission and strategy and for our collections, how to deliver a lot of the digital ambitions we have. For example, what I put in the strategy and we think is very important is that at the center we should have the collections management system. So I think yesterday we were all too busy drinking Prosecco probably to even play with the open collections portal. Our collections management system fits in the, the digital information from our collections fit, feed into the all partners, the portal for all three. But as Ian, who is responsible for development for this and the other partners as well, we all know it's work in progress and it requires quite a lot of the more imaginative, creative kind of things to be built on top. But we think it's very important that they sit on a solid base and we don't just do the creative engaging things just in kind of separate routes. And now, says she, having organized this, I should have remembered to open the link um, rather than eating cake at the break um, because PowerPoint won't like it. 
this is a partner project. So um, <coughs> it was developed, I'm going to talk about the Traveler's Tales project, which is spelled on purpose, T-A-I-L, sorry. Uh, And that's just a very short introduction. What was it like being somewhere totally new? I mean, completely out of your comfort zone. Nowadays, is exploration more about just where you went on holiday? Where is there left in the world to explore? When we think about the empire, isn't there something that's not spoken about? Why does exploration often lead to exploitation? Like, what's considered exotic today? So, what happened to, to these people that were supposedly discovered? So, do you think there's a link between art and science? Do you think the kangaroo really looked like that? How did he get it to keep still? Well, it seems like everything's based on the Big Bang Theory, but what about if you don't agree with that? What does it mean to explore today? Okay, sorry for the sound. <laughs> I hope your ears are still okay. But I thought it was important very quickly to give you a little bit of a taste of some of the questions. The art and science is at the heart of William Hunter's work, for example, what I was saying, because those days they were much more closely related. So this project, which was about, uh, this was the exhibition that we developed the digital trail for, is a collaborative project and it started from Royal Museums Greenwich and it wasn't just the Hadir, it was also the Horniman, the Grand Museum of Zoology at University College London and the Captain Cook Memorial Museum in Whitby, an independent museum, quite a small one in the um, city where Captain Cook was born. Th three, four very different um, museums and institutions and if you count us as well, Academic, we are uh, together with the Grand Museum, the only university ones. Very different style, very different audience and approach, but we were all related with this project because it all started when the two paintings um, by George Stubbs, this is one, and it's a bit of a shame to stick the text on top of, kind of next to the kangaroo. Um, but these were painted in the 19th century and they were extremely important. You might not think he was depicting it very accurately. It was the first, this is the first painting ever of a kangaroo that Western audiences saw. Uh, so it's not just about liking it or not, but also understanding a little bit why is it important, why there was so much. It was a very big campaign and the Heritage Lottery Fund helped an awful lot with this project. So we're very happy to get the funding for this. Uh, there was a big campaign to get money so that the paintings wouldn't leave the country and there, was, there has to be, there had a, to be a very good case of why they were important and a very good um, series of events and workshops for public engagement. George Stubbs was the greatest animal painter of his time and William Hunter one of his best customers. <laughs> He, together with others, he, uh, in this case, he commissioned uh, some of the paintings and it was the time when William Hunter would go and give talks to the Royal Society. He would, didn't have PowerPoint, so he was putting things like the painting under his arm and he would go and talk with this next to it about the development of the species. This was quite a few years before George, Charles Darwin, but he has his ideas of evolution, for example, which were very interesting for the time. And the artistic and scientific dialogues were very interesting. Joseph Banks, uh, he was on board the ship with Captain Cook when they were doing their exploration. So they, when they came back and they brought just the skin from a kangaroo, uh, they gave it to Stabs with uh, the drawings that they had from the expedition and he had to make the painting. So uh, all this voyage of discovery and so many different themes, each museum taking where the painting traveled to, the kangaroo painting, um, had to design an exhibition according to their own character and collections. So in the case of the Hunterian, we linked it to a lot of items we had. For conservation reasons, we couldn't have it at the main museum. It had to be across at the gallery. So for those of you, that's why you remember the map I showed you. They're very close. They're five minutes walks from each other, but they're different institutions. There's a big busy avenue kind of splitting the two. They're both on the campus of the University of Glasgow, but also in the West End that you now have had a little bit of a chance to experience if you haven't been here before. So I'll come back to this point, but this was the evaluation show that the digital was not enough to make this intellectual, but physical links. What we wanted was to use the trail as one of the many tools. We never think digital is the only answer. 
to encourage people to link the exhibition, which was relatively small but had some really important key items there, with the rest of the collections in the museum, for example, but also in the gallery. Um, so, for example, we had some bar cloth, this is one of the side, and because we are for the museum uh, of our type, we had a lot of the, the specimens from the zoology museum, the anthropological ones as well, and special collections, which we're very fortunate in Glasgow has really a fabulous collection, also collaborated with us to bring some of the notes and some of the information from all these things. So this was an exciting time. Remember, it was 18th century, and a lot of these animals, they were seeing it from exotic places for the first time. But as the little video kind of alluded to, what did the people from Australia or Polynesia, all the islands that saw the great explorers coming, they were not really discovered. They were all the time with their own culture anyway. And so it was all kinds of questions and issues that this raised, quite complex ones as well. Um, I mentioned the difficulty. So, for example, the two colored ones we wanted to link and we wanted to encourage the visitors to explore these things and make the connection. We thought everything should be web-based to allow for people who couldn't come to Glasgow to the exhibition to also uh, be able to see this. But that, as the way other speakers kind of talk to and refer to this, although we think the online accessibility is crucial, on the other hand, we didn't have the time or resources to design differently. So does one tool fit everything? It's something we, I think we can discuss later on. This and what the slides show, and mainly the involvement with the students. You see on the left with the dark hair is Tasha Moorhead. She graduated just recently from the Museum Studies course and also History of Art. She is the reason you probably have, you might not have noticed, I won't tell her though, that at the back of your labels you have some of the design of the poster because she's got so good artistically and she volunteered to help a little bit with the project but had to fly yesterday to the States so she wasn't able to attend the conference but has been sending me comments kind of live streaming. But this was last year when uh, a lot of these are our muses. The other project we have at the Hunterian, I mentioned the hubs, the PhDs, these uh, don't have to be exclusively undergraduates, but they're usually the ones that take people around for, I will call them guided tours, but I think that's where this exhibition was very interesting because they engaged in a lot of different ways, really in a dialogue. So I'll really whiz through, from the, through the exhibition to finally show you um, some of the designs that Carolyn and I worked together for the um, app. This had to be really simple, very complex. I only touched upon, but the ideas of the exhibition were not that easy to kind of pass and give across. There were two ways. So if you clicked on the location, the orange button, you would get this, and then you could choose which of the first, the big screen at the top, and then you would click and get the bottom, uh, either the left or the right, depending on which color you picked. So on your left, is the museum and on the right is the floor plan of the gallery and the dots refer to the different themes in the exhibition and the objects you can click to find out more. So this had to be, these are the three exhibition themes, art and nature, exploring the South Pacific, and handling and the exotic animals. And I'll go very quickly through the slides to give you a taste, which um, is not the same as using it on the thing because there's at the moment too, many, too much text, but you could see at the bottom the other objects you can go to and at the top, the other two themes, if you wanted to move there. And there were questions that after a lot of discussion with different users and formative uh, testing, we decided this, how can, much can you cram? We didn't want it to be a story on the wall. So what is this? Why is it important? How was it made? And there was a what do you think at the bottom to encourage people to tweet. Um, the moose is part of our collection by George Tubbs. It was a very nice kind of... Uh, its cousin from London came to visit with a kangaroo, so we had them in the same exhibition. So it was tweeting throughout the exhibition. And um, all the painting, this is in the main museum by William Hunter. You see, for example, the painting of William Hunter is in a different location. So we thought it was uh, important, and this is the gravid uterus, because it's one of the main key textbooks showing the different stages of pregnancy that Hunter was using for his teaching. And the Nilgai eye, a lot of sensitive topics here. We had the painting in the uh, gallery and the eye in the museum. So, or the elk or the mastodon, which was under extinction. The bark beater and the bark cloth. So this thing, the gorgeous and the bark beater was in the museum and the bark cloth I showed you quickly was in the gallery. So it's just a taste, you can see why we thought this on the right is some of the tweets from the Hunterian moose. 
but the main thing here is evaluation. I didn't want to just talk about the project. So we tried both quantitative and qualitative, and it was very important. The students were part of our audience as well. They worked together throughout designing this. They helped us brainstorm and do research about the objects together with the curators. And then they wrote, this is part of their journal. And you see some of their notes. There were also some of them, they were guests using the Twitter account to tweet about the moose or from the moose's perspective about the exhibition ra um, rather than just uh, about this. And we also observed and interviewed different visitors. We tried Sarah Monkey with, with not so many brilliant results, but um, we also had the online questionnaires and just so different methods there. But just to mention briefly, and we did the analysis of the logs. As with, I think, was evident from the other speakers, this is a very complex business. If you want to evaluate what's the experience of a visitor in a gallery, whether using digital or not, there's no single of these things, even if there's no perfect method. You really have to use at least more than one. Um, Wi-Fi let us down badly several times, and I know it's a bit ridiculous, but if you are not an academic at Europe, not even University of Glasgow visitor, it's still problematic to do the guest Wi-Fi and all the other different things in the gallery. We are the public engagement front face of the university, and it's still difficult. And I know from the Acropolis Museum, which was opened a few years ago in Greece, the highest public profile one and a lot of other ones, even in the most modern one, it's not as reliable as we would like it. So it is an issue when creating so much, so much effort, so much content, and we expect everything to work through that. We thought from all of this, um, the experimentation was important. We are a university museum, so testing and trying, we don't think this was perfect, but it was a way for us, not just to test with our audiences, but in a sense with our mediators. We found from experience, when we had the iPads, we got two iPads from the project, not just relying on people kind of logging in the Wi-Fi code, but they were already set up. The human presence of our enthusiastic and very knowledgeable by that stage students engaging via the technology, but not necessarily only via that, made all the difference. Okay, in this time and age when we talk and write about unmediated experiences through technology, I think it was actually very reassuring to see that the human factor remains crucial. I think we all knew that. It shocked me to see when I was checking our latest data, the exhibition closed last February and people still go and do the Traveler's Tale. It's deeply buried in our website, in the archives of old exhibitions, the link. We don't have it anywhere else. And we still have so many different visitors. So the online resource, I think you should have it there, despite all the, different, the difficulties maybe and the need maybe to rethink what's your audience, the off-site and the online, and what do the different users want. But actually, it's really nice when you do all this effort. It wasn't just in a special app that required maybe proprietary software, but it was running on the web, and people can see it even as an archive, if not play with it, even when the exhibition has been demandled and closed by that stage. So we discovered, but even without the digital, having the students engage with families or different groups and saying, and if you want, we can continue the tour just across the road. The minute they would say this, there would be all kinds of excuses, which we should really respect. People didn't want to go across. They saw it as another visit, another institution. Our own institutional boundaries and associations, why should they care about them? It's a little bit like disciplines. And we should have realized this, and it's interesting for us for the next, that's why evaluation is important, because it informs the next stages. Um, I think I'll stop here so I don't abuse the time, and I'll leave you with our lovely moose. <laughs> Thank you very much, Maria. Can I invite all the speakers from this session to... Uh, Go to the table over there and get you all to think about what questions you might want to pose. I think there are two microphones there. I'll hang out by this one. Whilst you're settling yourselves, I've got, I've got a question I'm quite interested in because I think both Maria and Alison touched on this and it's about humans, people mediating experiences between things that's content that sits on technology and the visitor and how you feel we could do better jobs at helping equip those people who mediate the experience. They're usually working in galleries, frontline staff. Um, how do we help them do that mediation better? Do you... 
Do you mean the Vista Services? You yeah. mean the Vista Services people? The people who might be um, not just there to help explain how things work, but also actually incentivize people taking them up in the first place, I guess. I, I think um, I've, I feel a great deal for Vista Services teams. Um, operations is considered, I think, boring, low-grade work in institutions, and they do not get brought into the design process and, and their needs considered early enough on. And over time, that ends up as people can be a bit grumpy and resistant, and then that encourages a, 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 sort, of a, a sort of a vicious cycle. If you bring them into the design process and, treat, and, and they are truly respected, it turns out that A, they know their stuff because, you know, in the Van Gogh Museum, they're talking to a million and a half visitors every year. They know exactly who the visitors are and what their problems are. Um, but they become really active participants and they'll figure out the solutions for you as you go through. Mm. Um, and, and there are obviously some people who do that better than others, but they're a powerhouse. And the great thing about the sort of the research process is that if they're in there, they know why you're doing it. And then that feeds through to the sort of the staff. So when we did the training, when we finally got to the training at the Van Gogh Museum, the training pack was all about the impact it had on visitors. So it was, we want people to have this because we've discovered it, it helps them have a better than expected time. They will learn more. They're more likely to come back. They're more likely to spend. Da, 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 da. And we would go through all that with them. So you're not telling them they have to sell. Mm -hmm. You're saying your visitors <coughs> need this and they will benefit from it. Mm -hmm. And then they're like completely up for promoting it mm -hmm. and doing everything they can. And they also know that it works. So we had things like we designed with a target handout time. It had to be handed out in, I think, I can't remember what the time is, but it's something like 30 seconds. You had to be able to facilitate it. And we tested that because they told us that was important. Mm -hmm. And that, that sort of cemented the bond, mm -hmm. I think, for us. Interesting. And Maria, did you, did you involve your frontline staff in the design process? It was a very good question. I think because we often forget them and they're really valuable. And we forget, especially from my research, as we talked about this session today and the visitor studies and the evaluation perspective, they're the ones that you have almost 100% of your sample, maybe when they have the lunch break or something like that, but actually they're there at the front every day and they see what's happening and they get a feel of what's around. We try to involve them, but I think that's what I meant about the Wi-Fi as well. If they were not there with their enthusiastic and kind of patience to hand out codes to people and be willing to help a little bit and mediate because the students are there for certain times and they had to go back to their studies and exams and different things while the front house staff are constantly there. So I think we should be doing more actually as an institution and also recognize them in for more formal ways, but it's a little bit of a reciprocal thing. Mm -hmm. You also shouldn't push it where if people don't want to take, but I think you should create several opportunities. Some of our younger and very well educated in the case of the University of Glasgow staff for the gallery attendance and sometimes often our students pass from that afterwards before they get other jobs as well. Sometimes they know much more than we do almost about mm. these things. Uh, so it's really a valuable resource, I think, and mm. not, of, not, I think, as much used as it should be. Interesting. Maria Simu can probably attest to this. She used to be one of our gallery attendants before she became more important on the team, as well as graduating. So it's part of this cycle. Interesting. Um, so over to you, to the floor, in the front row, Charlie. Thanks. Maria, I just wanted to ask, was it solely students who were the volunteer mediators? And if so, <coughs> did you consider to training volunteers from the wider Glasgow community? Um, and if not, why, why didn't you? Very good question. I forgot to mention we're also fortunate. Just before my post was created, which is a relatively new one, we had a, a year before student engagement post, Ruth Fletcher, who was at the workshop, and she's, sorry, I just realized she's in the audience as well, um, has the difficult and increasingly busy role of coordinating all this activity. It's a very good question. I think Ruth will reply afterwards to this. In this case, because it was a partnership project and we discussed with the other partners, and because there's so much resource, and actually this ties in so well with the courses, we didn't open it up to other community <coughs> members. No, we didn't, yeah. and it's, it's something to do with the strategy that we're doing here. Part, my role was 
created in order to enhance the connection with the Hunterian and the, stu and the students here at the university to enhance the student experience and the learning experience. So because we're a university museum, our um, audience is very much priority for volunteering, internships and all the rest of it goes to the student body and we have a very high demand. So occasionally in the, the summer periods, the vacation um, periods, we stretch the boundaries a little bit on that. If, if I can't get what I need from the student body, I have taken um, requests from elsewhere. But in terms of our priorities, we've, we've kept it to the student body. But other partners in this same project didn't do so because they weren't university museums. But I think it's an interesting point for us to consider strategically. It's a bit the numbers and the practicalities, but the core of your question, I think the meaning behind it would be so valuable both for students and communities and for us to open more that can make it more of a triangle. And we could also say that moving here to the Kelvin Hall, um, because we are a, this is a, a partnership a project, that there are volunteer teams that feed from the wider community, and I think we have some of the volunteers here today, <laughs> as well as um, our student volunteers join in in that too. So that is opening up. Any more questions from the floor? Yes, in the middle, in the stripy top. Um, I have a question for Maribel. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. So I was wondering whether during the observations, you know, there's a need change in the behavior of art historians as they navigated and got more familiar with the resources. Uh, usually, uh, there were a couple of art historians who already knew the resources they were testing. Generally, they don't know them. This is actually a problem for museums to make them the, the resources available to art historians because they don't know how to find them. Um, and yeah, when they were familiar, because actually that was with this online scholarly catalog, which is actually quite hard to navigate because it has too many fun different functionalities and too many sections. That yeah, that art historian she 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 knew how to how to open every window, where to go to find the different places, and so it needs yeah actually art history. Sometimes you have to be kind of trained or learn how to use some resources. It's it's not very intuitive sometimes. So okay, thank you. Thank you. Front row just to make it. This is a bit of a question to Maria as organizer of this event. <laughs> How do we get beyond these fantastic lessons that we hear? Uh, what can we do? Because, well, we, we all see how time consuming it is, how difficult it sometimes is to get people so involved. And we also see that a lot of institutions find it difficult to even begin this kind of intense type of designing your evaluation process. So how can we, what can we do as a community to get this beyond this event. What are your plans? He just, you just told what I was thinking should be our uh, closing kind of discussion, but it was one of the things I was thinking. I didn't have the time in my talk, but I think it's a wider point to say, okay, great project or not, but this is a project. Why, why should I care? What's the lessons learned for me? Like thinking of all the people in the audience and beyond, the, beyond this room as well. I think. I think you will agree with me, there was a great vibe the last few days, there was a lot of very interesting conversations and a lot of common issues and questions. I think that's what we need to do and we should start moving towards. I was talking with Ian before because he couldn't make the afternoon ones, who was chairing the Petra Kucha poster sessions. And he said, I said, is there anything I can report afterwards when we do the closing discussion? He said, talking with others, I think there's a critical mass. There's a community of practice that has started developing. A few years ago, we were talking more about the need to do more of these things. There's, I think there was a lot of practice already and reflection, which was very nice to see about the practice. We're not quite there yet. It is cultural heritage and collections of this kind that it's not Argos catalog, it's not that easy to actually say what worked in the Hunterian's case, in the London Metropolitan Archive or the Van Gogh or whatever. You can actually just throw in another case and make it work. But I think what some of the common guidelines, there were things we're all saying in different ways and deciding and agreeing upon 
which are the key sort of tips, lessons to take away, whatever you call the methods that work, under which circumstances, and kind of deciding upon those kind of tools and information and communicating, that's, I think, the crucial next step. And I think we just made a small step today, but it was progress in that direction. I just want to add, I think we need to, I really feel this, need to articulate where risk really lies. If you were doing a digital project, like the biggest, the biggest risk is that you shouldn't be doing it at all, that there is no audience appetite for it, there is no institutional need, and you shouldn't be spending the money in the first place. So we, we have to acknowledge that the risk is, is sometimes that we have to have done the work to figure out should we be doing it. And then if it is worth doing, we have to do it well in order to d deliver the impact so that, you know, we have to understand risk and communicate risk better. And we then have to, uh, we have to understand and communicate impact and outcomes better and focus on, on that. And I, I think if we can get over our love affair with sort of bells and whistles and shiny things, I complete, I'm completely there. I own, I own that myself too. Um, I think if we can focus on those two bits and and say to people, you know, some people say, well, it's going to cost us more or take longer to do it that way. But the question is if it it might cost a bit more, take a bit longer, but if you shouldn't have been doing it in the first place or you do it and you do it badly and nobody uses it, you've wasted all the money. And, it, you know, I, I have to say some of our successes have been about saying to people, please don't do that. And we've had people come back and said, you saved us tens of thousands of pounds, we, you know, because we haven't done that thing. That to me is just as much as a success as something like the Van Gogh project, where they did do it and, and it worked out better. Any more questions? Yes, in the centre there. Well, we're getting to the question just to add, so deciding also about evaluation, how to do it, how not to do it, and maybe <laughs> and the research is the same. Yeah, and Alison, I think to that, and I'm Emily Oswald, PhD student at the University of Oslo. I'm so interested in hearing how you uh, connect that kind of thinking. It's important to do the design process and think well and ask, do we need this? How do you connect that to something like the Heritage Lottery Fund's um, interest in outcomes and <laughs> uh, sort of moving practice at the level of the field? Um, because to me, that seems like uh, it's important to have the conversation in this room, and then it's important to connect it to policy um, as well. So I, I don't think we can answer that question right now before lunch, but <laughs> yeah, Karen might want to <laughs> comment. Just feed that. Maybe we can leave lunch to us. Yes. <laughs> Go ask Karen over we lunch. We can all yeah. think about this overeating and thinking and. If, I don't know, uh, putting my other hat on, if we finish with this session, just Thanks. what I forgot to say at the beginning, and I emailed my chairs, but I forgot to tell all of you, and I think because they got so many emails from me the last week, me and Rosie, they probably was, it's, it's come d deeply buried somewhere and they haven't seen it. I asked all the chairs, I haven't really thought through exactly how we'll do the closing remarks, I wanted to really be interactive rather than also kind of few people decide. So I asked all the chairs that were still here to maybe come and kind of join me here and find three people, ideally who they don't know, who haven't, didn't know before coming here, and try to get from them the one thing that they thought was useful or that taking this an important issue that they got from the last two days of the symposium. So if you haven't had your chance, try to find also, from the other side, try to find your chairs and, and pass on these things, maybe over lunch, so we can do this afterwards. Okay, and I think we have one hour. I don't know how we're doing with time. Yeah, so if we are back, um, because we lost the last speaker, I think we're okay. An hour from now, I've got 10 to with my watch. So 10 to 1.